she's been running the she's been running the arts and humanities research council funded project theater and visual culture in the long 19th century there'll be a link in this uh, later on in the chat and a new project has started just last month an international project uh, the Women Theatre Network. There's a longer title, but I haven't got my head around that. Uh, please put your Zoom screen on speaker view for the best view of the discussion and mute yourself to hear a talk on 19th century woman who wrote passionately and clearly about the struggle to gain human rights for women, which even now are not won. Welcome, Dr. Kate Newey. Thank you. And thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's a real honour to to talk to you all. So, um, Alison, how shall we start? Do you, uh, well, um, I can I can ask you a little bit about uh, mm -hmm. you know you, you're a theatre uh, professor mm -hmm. of theatre studies. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you get on to Harriet Taylor Mill? Oh, right. Um, yeah, my my technically my title is professor of theatre history, and I'm really an historian. And in my undergraduate um, history degree. I wrote my um, final year dissertation, which in those days was 20,000 words, <laughs> nowadays a lot less, I think, um, on John Stuart Mill and the condition of England question. Um, so I read everything that John Stuart Mill had written, except I, I, I didn't read the system of logic. I'd done a year's worth of philosophy <laughs> and had, had, had studied Rossellian logic, Bertrand Russell's logic. And I thought, oh, I just, but I was really intrigued. Um, John Stuart Mill is one of my heroes. And I was always aware, and I've got a little slide about this, but I was always aware um, that he attributed a lot of his writing from the 1840s onward. So he's, he's writing his big works like On Liberty, Utilitarianism, Subjection of Women are all written in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And in his autobiography, which was one of my starting points for my work on a kind of cultural understanding of John Stuart Mill, he says that everything he wrote after he met Harriet Taylor is absolutely imbued with their discussions and that really she's the co-author. All the John Stuart Mill historians and biographers and so on go, oh, he was a love-struck, infatuated man, you know, who who overstated this case. But um, I think if we're going to accept his other aspects of his autobiography at 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 face value, you know, for what he says, then why shouldn't we take this claim seriously and have a look at what um, Harriet Taylor, although that's I'm going to talk about her names. Um, <laughs> have a look at what Harriet Taylor was writing and how her words really are then echoed in in some of the the texts that just have John Stuart Mill's name on them. Um, and um, it's quite fascinating to see how her language moves from an early essay in 1851 on the enfranchisement of women into the very thought through complex text of something like the subjection of women, which is, um, you know, their great um, feminist text. Right. Yeah. So, um, so it's been a long journey. And and actually the Women's Declaration International, which is where Alison and I sort of first met virtually, um, uh, there was some, we, we, it does a Sunday morning webinar, which is a really kind of wonderful, I'm learning so much coming in and listening to other people. So people talk about various kind of uh, canonical feminist texts. And someone was talking about something in the 20th century. And I popped in the chat, oh, this is really what John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor Mill were talking about. And um, the organizers of these webinars got in touch with me and said, would you like to do something about that? So I did a session on um, John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor Mill um, on the, the subjection of women on just that text. And then I did a further one looking at the earlier writing of, of Harriet Taylor and um, also a little bit of detail on her daughter, Helen Taylor, 
was very involved with um, local government in the last uh, three decades of the 19th century. Um, right. So this is uh, uh, another version of that. Right, I see. Um, now, Harriet Hardy, as she was, was born mm. in 1807 mm -hmm. and lived until 1858, died in Avignon. Mm. And as you say, her daughter was Helen. She was an actress in Sunderland. Which, Briefly, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so uh, you're going to give us a little bit about her background like this and then tell us about her writing, is that right? Yes, I've got a lot of slides with a lot of text, so please do interrupt or ask questions. I mean, you know, my job is talking, so um, do do I'll, I'll pause every now and again for people to catch their breath and, and perhaps read the slides. But if I um, put my slides up, and um oh wait a minute there we are um and this is a picture of harriet taylor which you can find is it can everyone see that now have yep. you seen the slide sharing great thank you um so this is harriet taylor taken from just from the national portrait gallery there is a portrait of her in the national portrait gallery which i always think is quite important any of the women i work on i always check the National Portrait Gallery website to see if they have any holdings. Um, and so, yes, as Alison mentioned, um, there's a thing about her name. Um, she was born Harriet Hardy. She then married quite young at 18 to John Taylor, who was much older than her. Um, and they had three children. Uh, born in 1827, 1830, and then two boys, and then um, the daughter, Helen. Um, and they were Unitarians, and they were part of the North London, Finsbury um, congregation of uh, William Fox. So if we think back to uh, one of our feminist mothers, Mary Wollstonecraft, who also lived, um, well, she lived in Stoke Newington, very close. So there's this really interesting sort of you know, if you think, I, I was showing an American uh, friend around London yesterday, and we went to Hampstead, and he said, so where's Hampstead in relation to London? And I said, well, it's a series of villages. So the Finsbury, Stoke, Newington area, I think it's still pretty radical, actually, mm. um, part of sort of radical London. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, Anne Robson, who is the wife, I'm assuming, of John Robson, who is a major um, editor of John Stuart Mill, um, University of Toronto collected edition of what they call John Stuart Mill's writing, comes out of um, uh, John John Robson is is the major editor. Oh. Started in about 18, uh, 1960, so it's been a very long project. But Anne Robin, Robson, in her book, Sexual Equality, a Miller Taylor Reader, um, has traced 11 pieces before Harriet met John Stuart Mill. And then her major essay was published in the Westminster Review under John Stuart Mill's name. And he, the Westminster Review is another um, really important, very highbrow journal of the 19th century and a place for liberal, radical uh, thought. And I'm throwing around the term radical. It doesn't mean what it might mean today. We have to think of politics in this period as pre-Marxism. So we're really in the mother load of liberalism and liberalism in this period was radical. And Mill and Harriet called themselves socialists. Mill says in, I think it's in utilitarianism, he talks about being a socialist, but again, it's not a Marxist socialism. He read people like, he read a lot of the French theorists like Comte, Auguste Comte, he writes about, Saint-Simon, um, he was very interested in Robert Owen, you know, he and he was really searching for um, a way of making his father and Jeremy Bentham's regime of utilitarianism, of making it appeal to a social culture 
that had poetry and theatre and art and music. So that's really what they're trying to do is, OK, so we have this principle of, the, of utility, the greatest good for the greatest number. And we have these principles of liberty. But what for? Liberty to do what? And so he goes back to the poets and so on. So I think this is very interesting aspect of one of the people that we might see as the the, the found founders of of modern day liberal thought, really as well. Um. So um, this is someone who's written a whole book about Harriet Taylor Mill, much much more expert than I am, um, talking about the way. Uh, that Harriet and John Stuart Mill found a way to write together. Um, and uh, Mill himself talks about this, that they discussed these ideas constantly. So by the time they were married, and of course their relationship was a huge scandal in the 1830s, um, but John Taylor died, um, Probably the reason Harriet Taylor died early in 1858 uh, was that it's quite likely that John Taylor had a venereal disease and she um, may have been ill from that. Um, I suspect that's why she only had three children, for example. I suspect that they may well have been a, right, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, and I think when when I, I've got a couple of slides with some extracts from some of um, Harriet and John Stuart Mill's um, early writing on domestic violence. And I just wonder whether there's a kind of a very personal thread through this writing. Yeah, I, I think there is. I, I, reading uh, um, uh, Joellen Jacobs' monster work as you say oh yeah she's, she's got a note right at the beginning in uh, when she's talking about educating women for men's enjoyment <laughs> and uh, and she talks about uh, three quarters of our adult male population pay for sex is what she's saying mm. um, and the note is that whether uh, harriet taylor mill's statistics are correct this kind of passionate denouncement was certainly be expected of a 24 year old woman who'd recently learned that she'd connect contracted syphilis from her husband Mm. I've never read that anywhere else before and, uh, no. that's, uh, and so and that seems to have the ring of truth doesn't it it does and um Mill as a young man <laughs> he was oh he was such a nerd I'm, I'm just a hero <laughs> but a nerd but before he met Harriet Taylor he was almost arrested for handing out leaflets about contraception this is like in the 1820s so um you know he was he was a real free thinker on these matters um in the right way he wasn't a kind of libertarian sort of um every woman is my my right kind of thing he was he was a good um a, a kind of feminist ally in the way that we would recognize today i think and certainly he was um very supportive of women like Josephine Butler, who were protesting against the Contagious Diseases Acts, which were also to do with the spread of venereal disease um, in the male population, um, particularly in the um, standing army in the middle of the 19th century. There's a whole other discussion one could have about the, the, um, the, the women's movement. It was one of the first major campaigns, I think, yeah. of the women's movement and people talk about the 1970s as the second wave of feminism but i always think really it's the third wave we had this earlier um contagious diseases act um activism in the middle of the 19th century and it was a really significant feminist campaign mm. and a difficult one because it was respect so-called respectable women talking about the thing they were not supposed to know about how did that go down with polite society? Not well. <laughs> and and there is some evidence to suggest um, that my hero, John Stuart Mill, um, when he was uh, moving towards his um, agitation for the female franchise, uh, when he was, a, he was a member of parliament, um, 
he did not want women who were associated with the um, anti-contagious diseases act activism to speak on his platform in his um platform you know his his um campaign, campaign. for election mm -hmm. so okay. even he found they were barriers right so it would be like uh, he didn't want to give them a platform in case it uh, ruined his prospects yeah 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 um uh, but the Contagious Diseases Acts were really horrific uh, in, in the way that they um, uh, treated most working women as prostituted women. Um, and women suspected of being prostituted, and I, I use that language, they would use prostitute, um, could be locked up in what were called lock hospitals and subjected without consent to gynecological examination. <laughs> it you know um and this was a way of trying to control uh venereal disease in sailors and soldiers so you yes. lock up the women yeah for the defense of the realm then yeah 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 so mill was very much a supporter and this was after harriet's death of course um but you can see the connection about that that his his support of women protesting against this legislation but he was also wary of being too publicly connected with them for his own interests sad but you know i think no politics is pure as i mean you know you you're all much more involved in in political parties than than i'm not a member of any political party um i even am not at the moment a member of my college my universities and college union um uh and you know it's not a pure game yeah. you know yeah so um so shall i just go on and i've got a few slides that um have uh if i can find where i go backwards Oh, where am I going? Sorry, I'm losing myself in my slides. Um, oh yeah, this is, so this is, um, this is another scholar, Alice Rossi, who argues um, that uh, Harriet Taylor Mill's essay, The Enfranchisement of Women um, was, uh, well, you can see what she writes there, that this is the um, uh, kind of one of the first, essays to make a, an intellectual logical argument and a political argument for the equality of women. Um, I would say we need to think back to Mary Wollstonecraft, but her book, um, The a Vindication of the Rights of Women, which was written as a kind of a riposte to Thomas Paine's radical post-French Revolution writing, it's a it's a wild book. It's not really got a series of logical arguments. My students love it. They say, oh, it's such a rant. So, you know, if you want a good energetic rant, read Mary Wollstonecraft. But if we want the logical, valid, almost indisputable arguments, then um, I think um, Harriet Taylor and John Stuart Mill are your, your go to writers. Um, so I'm just trying to get back to Sorry about flicking through. Ah, here we are. So this is some of the earliest writing of the two mills. And they had a gig in the early 1850s, as you can see here, for writing leader articles for the Morning Chronicle, which was a daily newspaper. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't a Tory newspaper like the Times. And it wasn't a totally radical newspaper, something like the Poor Man's Guardian, which um, was a, is a wonderful, really radical. It's the kind of forerunner of the Morning Star nowadays, I think, you know, really chartist radical newspaper. Um, but what they do is they are following the law courts and they're reporting on various cases, particularly around domestic violence, um, the uh, guardianship of children between parents, um, father and mother, and um, murder, manslaughter. So here we have 
them talking about here um, the corporeal violence that men are feel entitled to do that and and their 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 point i think i think harriet taylor particularly her point is that once when you have a legal system that encourages men when they are married to think of their wives as theirs then when men treat their wife like the horse or the ass that carries their burden um, and it's then only seen as manslaughter, which is the case that here's the second part of that article where um, you can, if, if, if you can read that slide, I'm, I'm sorry, it's such a wodge of language. Um, what you see is this righteous rage coming through the language, I think, about the ways that the legal system seems to entitle any man who's married to feel that his wife is his property just as his horse is his property. Um, and that the conviction of, of beating his wife is that the jury is not convinced that um, this man intended death. And so therefore the man gets away with a verdict of manslaughter. And lest we get too complacent we just have to think of the so-called rough sex defences nowadays. Yeah. I mean, this is not pretty stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> Seven o'clock on a Monday evening. Um, <clears throat> but it, um, I think what's interesting is the way that Harriet and John Stuart Mill argue very rigorously. It's really hard to poke holes in the logic of their argument. So they're a wonderful tool for us. Um, so this is another article about wife murder. Um, and what they say is, if this man had killed another man's wife, he would have hanged. And the killer line at the bottom of this extract, it's a longer article I've just extracted, the, the vow to protect thus confers a license to kill. I mean, it's 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 shocking in its brevity and its truth. Um, and what they go on to argue in the enfranchisement of women and then the the longer uh, book, the subjection of women, is that this so called um, legal protection of wives within marriage this was the excuse oh well your husband's there to look after you to protect you actually works against women's safety um when you have this unequal power um and then there's a very sad one here which is about the custody of children and again i imagine um, that Harriet's heart is in this kind of, um, it's a very empathetic article um, because on the set, she and her first husband, John Taylor, um, organized a kind of a, a separation and she had to live apart from her children. Um, and she's not the only woman at this time. The famous actress, um, Fanny Kemble, um, who famously marries a Southern um, gentleman whose name oh, escapes me. <laughs> um, and um, she marries him thinking that he does not own slaves. He's a plantation owner in Georgia, I think. Um, and she meets him while she's touring uh, America with her father. Um, uh, and then, you know, she was this very um, completely sensational actress from the age of 18. Um, and she marries this American plantation owner, but he says, no, I don't have slaves. However, he was lying to her. And when she finds out that he um, his wealth comes from enslavement, she um, leaves him. And the, for the next 15 years or so, she goes back to Britain. The next 15 years or so, 
she is separated from her children because the law in both Britain and the United States at the time was that um, on the separation of a married couple, the father automatically has, has custody, guardianship and all rights over the children. Again, they are his property. Um, so here, Mill and um, Mill and Taylor are um, writing about a record. It's from the coroner's court, and it's the suicide of Sarah Brown. Seduced by a gentleman two years ago, obviously she has a child. I mean, you know, this is all wound up with a lack of women's control over their fertility. Um, and there's a custody battle. Um, and the Mills argue that the judge that oversaw the case was wrong and he did not have the right to um, give custody to the children's father because the children are illegitimate, therefore they don't have a father. Um, but as you can see in, in the, I've sort of made extracts, but I hope it makes sense. Um, the court then says, well, you can have the child for one month and then you can have the child for one month but the father being richer stronger takes the child and um the mother tries to take the child back cannot and ends up committing suicide out of obviously complete distress mm -hmm. about the loss of her child um and um Again, I think what the Mills are trying to point out is that it's a corrupt legal system within which women are always disadvantaged because they are not considered legally fully human. Um, and this is where I find um, Kelly J. Keene, Percy Parker's um, Standing for Women and her phrase, adult human female, um, a lot of feminist work still, the right sort, <laughs> still is looking at the ways in which we still, all of us, um, have to almost think twice about considering women as fully human. Um, and I, I, I think it, it's still, I think all of us internalise some form of, of that kind of difficulty um, you know, Carolyn Criado Perez talks about the default male. Um, and I think we're all guilty of that, you know, and we can't help it. We live within this system. So this is the early writing of uh, Mill and um, Harriet. Um, shall I go on to... to Carry on, yes, yes. Yeah, if, or unless there are any questions, people want to have a bit of a break from my voice. Uh, well, there's a comment in the chat. Uh, Nigel's made a comment about uh, modern free state-sponsored sexual health services beginning after the 1917 VD Act was passed. Ah. So everybody who might be infected had to undergo compulsory treatment. And that was because the army in World War One was losing active soldiers, again, again uh, after the, uh, the Mills time, because of the increase in sexually transmitted uh, infections. Mm. Uh, and so uh, he says this is a continuation of yeah. the attitude prevalent in Mill's time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Although my father, um, my father's 19, he did national service in the Navy. And he was used to, after a couple of glasses of wine, you could get him to talk about the, um, the talk they all got. Uh, he was a chief petty officer, I think, because he was a gentleman rather than a... You know, I mean, it's the class system, even in the national service in the 1950s. Um, and um, in the Navy, they all got a talk from, I, I'm not quite sure who, probably the bosun or something, about the instruments that um, would be inserted <laughs> of a, a man's tenderest parts <laughs> to see if there was a, um, a, a venereal infection. Um, and, and he always said this was supposed to, you know, scare all the young 18-year-olds. Um, uh undergoing national service um uh so i um at least they were talking to the the sailors about it rather than the the girls in the ports i don't i don't know yeah <laughs> um uh but yeah i mean i and i think it's also this broader argument that that is a quite a 
a common argument um, in a kind of feminist, um, really practical activism and debates. And we still see it in our contemporary politics, the ways in which women often have are, are positioned as the kind of moral guardians of our society, of our culture. You know, if a woman kills, it's seen as worse than if a man kills. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you often find women being punished more for mm. a similar sort of uh, offence as a man, but she gets a worse punishment because it's a greater offence, if you like. Yeah. And I think, is it Baroness? Is she now? Helena Kennedy has written about this. Um, Eve was framed. Is that is that the name of the book? Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't know. where. I, I think she's a Labour peer, isn't she? Not one of you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or on the cross benches. But um um, you know, that there, there is this understanding. Um, and I think we see it also currently still in um trials for sexual assault and rape. Um that even though there's strong um advice to the judiciary and indeed to juries, um, there are some uh residual myths about women's behaviour and men's behavior, you know, and, and their, um, their different culpabilities in um, uh, kind of issues around consent and so on. Of course, yeah. And we see it even more in uh, in other cultures, don't we? In Iran, of course, at the moment. Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, in fact, I have a Saudi Arabian um, PhD student who is writing a little bit about the, the um, document that the prince they all love him in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> um, but it's a document called The Vision 2030. Um, and it's um, partly uh, forecasting a, a, a legal pro a program of legal reform, which um, uh, there's a name for it, uh, but it basically starts to give women fully human rights. So they don't always need a male guardian with them to do things and this change is coming in Saudi Arabia I think it's a very neoliberal change there I think it's economically it's a sort um, of emancipation yeah yeah I mean I think it's economically driven but you know it's it's, it's um I'll take the wins <laughs> my student uh, well, my student uh, takes the wins she said oh yeah. if I don't want to veil I don't have to veil anymore you know Saudi has, has signed up has, has ratified the um CEDAW convention which of course America hasn't ah yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah that's, um... Well, I think the, the wealthy <laughs> Saudis um, have very well-educated wives, mothers, sisters, daughters, and they're starting to see that they're losing the economic power of those women if they don't allow them a little bit more freedom and, you know, a little bit more sort of fully human. So I think this is, you know, it's, um, again, there's no purity in any of these processes. They're slow and they're step by step. Um, but I do love Harriet's righteous rage in some of this early writing, I think. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of slides here. And if anyone wants to contact me afterwards, I can send the whole slide set. I can send it to you, Alison. You can send it out if that's Great. Thank helpful, you. If people want the full lecture. <laughs> um, but this is Mill talking about the way they worked together. And he also gives great uh, can, can you go back? You just yeah. moved on to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah. This is his autobiography. Um, and it was written just after Harriet's death. It's a fascinating read if you're interested in, in because he talks about a sort of mental crisis that he had in his 20s. And he says, after this, that's my, you know, that's the most important event in my life. Then I met Harriet and then that's it. That's the story of my life. Everything else just comes after that. Um, he was a very methodical thinker. You, I really, if you want clarity, if you want to get rid of all the, the, the sort of stuff that comes at us nowadays, reading his prose is a beautiful way to calm down <laughs> because he, he really tries to lay things out very clearly. Um, and then um, in the subjection of women, this is again from his autobiography, this is how they wrote it. Um, and he also gives credence to his, the woman he calls his daughter, his stepdaughter, Helen Taylor, who became his um, secretary after his mother's death and um, 
helped to pull papers together and so on. I mean, I think he was probably overcome with grief at his wife's death. And Helen Taylor probably did a really um, significant job in getting him through that and, and getting him um, thinking and writing again. Uh, but when we see passages from Harriet's essay, The Enfranchisement of Women, it, there's such an echo of the language in the subjection of women that I think the people who dismiss her contribution haven't really put the two side by side. So this is, where am I? I'm whizzing through. Okay. So this is the opening of Harriet Taylor Mill's essay published under John Stuart Mill's name in the Westminster Review in 1851. And it starts with a report, as you can see on the slide, of the Ohio Convention for Women in 1850. And Americanists among you may know more about this than I do, but you know, it starts to bring in some of the great um, American feminists. Um, I think, uh, is it Elizabeth Cady Stanton? Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's some extraordinary stuff. And one of the one of the Women's Declaration International um, seminars, the Sunday morning webinars, where we all learn so much, was partly about this and about the relationship of these Anglo-American women to the Indigenous First Nations people in the in the region of Ohio. It's really interesting. So you can see here already, Harriet is writing in this very um, logical reportage style, I think. You know, the brief summary of the principal demands. And um, then she says that women have as good a claim as men have to the suffrage would be difficult for anyone to deny. And this is her argument all the way through. If women are human beings, then what are your reasons for denying full equal rights? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> um, so um, she cites back at the Americans, and I thought this was the constitution and, and um, was it you, Alison? It was someone in the seminar when I was talking about Harriet Taylor to the WDI people said, I think that's a declaration of independence. It might've been one of the Americans. Um, so again, and this is a tactic that Mill uses with her in, in the essay, Subjection of Women, that they pick up the current law and they show how the paradox is implicit, you know, so all men are created equal. So if you are against the aristocracy, what she talk about the democratic soil of America, the aristocracy of color and so on, the extirpation, the getting rid of all of the old world hierarchies. Remember the formation of the United States is just before the French Revolution, it's it's a it's a um, uh, as a European kind of invasion colonization process. It's about freedom and liberty, and she's saying, "Well, then why can't we have this collective protest against the aristocracy of sex?" Um, so again, I think it's just this wonderful moment where whoops, where she's saying. You know, if you hold all of these things self-evident, then why is the why is sex? Um, and we often use the namby pamby term gender, but in the 19th century they talk about sex as the difference between men and women. Um if they want to talk about sexual intercourse, they'll talk about sexual intercourse, you know, they'll they'll this is and we're so we're so namby pamby about this word. Um <laughs> And I, I just think it's wonderful the way she just throws it back at them and says, you know, and all oh, she's reporting on on American women throwing it back at the founding fathers. So she starts with this um, account of um, the American uh, Women's Convention, and then she moves to Britain and she says, not only in America, but here in British in Britain. And if we think about 
the radicals and the chartists. And the last charter, you know, we've just had 1848 and the liberal democratic revolutions on the continent. You know, this is this is the foundation of the liberal democrats, isn't it? You know, this is really the moment. It was current affairs, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you people carry this tradition. And so, again, she's saying, if we're fighting to get rid of, and, and certainly the 1848 revolutions in, um, in con on mainland Europe um, started to really question all those uh, divine right of king kind of um, aristocratic, uh, well, dictatorships, monarchies, you know, and start to think about um, forms of liberal democracy in, uh, well, France already, but Germany, uh, Italy a little later, you know, so it's really the start of this whole movement of the development of the nation state as a liberal democratic state in in Europe. And I think we still live with that kind of inheritance, really. Um, and then Chartists in Britain. And now this is where, oh, I'm terrible. The six points of the charter, if anyone else can remember these. Um, I was I was on a socialist uh, historian's uh, webinar last week about the role of women in chartism and, and someone just reeled them off and I thought, I can never remember them. Um, the chartist had six um, claims or uh, the charter was six claims, annual parliaments, secret ballots, payment of the members of parliament, um, removing a property qualification for being an MP, but also for voting. Um, I'm trying to remember the others. I think it was also um, that members of parliament, if there was a sufficient petition, you know, a little bit like the Swiss still have now, that you could, a petition with a certain number of, of signatures and, and you had to then put that forward as a debate in parliament. I think that was one. Recall of MPs. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have some of those now. We don't have the annual parliaments, for example. But the one thing they didn't have, and they talk about universal suffrage, but they didn't have true universal suffrage. It's interesting that the enfranchisement of women was not part of the charter. Although, according to the seminar I went to last week, and I thought, oh, I must remember to talk to the Liberal Democrats about this, <laughs> um, women were very active in the Chartist movement. And I think there are some, possibly some very interesting um, networks to trace from the women, women's involvement in Chartism through to the Women's Social and Political Union, which then become the suffragettes. Yeah, interesting. So I think there's a, a really interesting through line of, of women's radicalism in the 19th century. And the same with unions as well, mm. lots of active women unionists. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so you can see here the logic. The Chartist who denies the suffrage to woman, women is a Chartist only because he is not a Lord. She's really calling into question the radical men's um, commitment to real radicalism. Yeah. He is one of those levelers who would level only down to themselves, you know, um, and it's so prescient, I think. Um, and I think I could go on all night about the contemporary parallels, really. And that goes right back to uh, John Ball and when Adam Delve needs spam, who was then the gentleman. Yeah. You know, 14th century. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and um, and I think it also goes forward to the suffrage argument, not necessarily suffragettes, but the broad suffrage argument at the end of the 19th century, where they say, and I mean, Mill and Taylor say this in The Subjection of Women, any man can vote and he can be a drunkard. He can be... Um, you know, uh, well, they would call them idiots in those days. You know, he can not have a great intelligence, no great understanding of the issues. Um, but um, women don't have this direct political influence. Of course, what a lot of feminist historians will say, well, 
that's one definition of what it is to be political and to have political power. There might be other ways to think about that. And I think, you know, I think that's a, an important question. And again, I mean, this group is another way to um, uh, try to, to exert pressure activism, you know, as yeah. you said in your introduction. Hmm. It's um, uh, another way of trying to um, uh, present, mul you know, um, alternate or, or um, points of view that are overlooked within within the broad framework of of liberalism. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and again, um, I think this is a really interesting point about taxation. And I picked this out of it's a it's a quite long essay, it's sort of 20, 30 pages. I picked this paragraph out because I thought it also chimes with the for, you know, one of the apparent causes of the American War of Independence, no taxation without representation. Um, and this is really what Harriet Taylor is alluding to, I think. Um, that taxation and representation should be coextensive. Uh, but she points out that unmarried women might pay taxes. And of course, this is before there's a standard income tax. You know, not everyone paid taxes. Um, there will be property taxes then, presumably. Yeah, there would be property mm -hmm. taxes. People pay taxes in all sorts of ways. You know, for example, um, uh, you paid a turnpike tax, you know, the toll road tax. You paid a tax um, uh, unless you knew a local aristocrat, you had to pay quite a large sum to post a letter. Um, so, you know, if you're if you're a reader of Jane Austen or whatever, or any of those novels where they talk about having a letter franked. And so it's by the, the local um, lord or whoever who who has the right to to send mail but you know and that's where trollope anthony trollope's invention or who was it his invention of the penny post whoever invented the penny Ro post. roland hill that's right yeah Hit sorry yeah. yeah but anthony trollope was a he worked as a civil service servant in the post office um and um you know it's quite a revolutionary thing to um in the same way that um in this period they just I think it's in the 1850s where they start to remove the duty, the tax on newspapers. Um, and for example, in the 1830s, the poor man's guardian um, had a huge campaign about removing the taxes on knowledge, they called them. So there were very diverse ways that ordinary people were taxed, but it wasn't always um, income tax. Um, but again, you know, um, you, you can see from from this paragraph that she's really pulling apart the paradoxes of what the law says it's doing and what is really happening. Right. Um, mm. Women are not tried by their peers, they're tried by men. I mean, I think what she's doing is also assuming sexual difference. She is really assuming, and, and this is where, you know, we, we, we find this language in radical feminists today, and it's part of our, some of our troubles <laughs> um, over identity politics, which is that she's really seeing um, sex class, you know, men and women as sex classes. Yeah. And I mean, this is before Marx and Engels do their analysis of capitalism and class in an economic sense. Um, but she's she's seeing men and women as, as separate classes. And obviously women are treated as such. And she's pointed out that, yeah, well, follow it through. So um, I put this section in because um, this is about the historical custom. And it's really echoed, as I say in, on the slide there, it's echoed at length in the first chapter of the subjection of women where they're really trying to make the case for why we need to think about this topic. Um, and um, so she's looking back over history. And I think what you get here is also a sense that we are now, and you know, she's writing in 1851, for her, that is modern, modern world. For us, it's, you know, almost 200 years ago. Um, 
but she's writing as a progressive thinker, a progressive activist um, about the modern world. And she's saying, we've progressed past the rule of force. Um, but we also have inherited this whole kind of rule of custom. Um, but she says, and, and it's right at the bottom, until very lately, the rule of physical strength was the general law of human affairs. Throughout history, the nations, races, classes, which have found themselves the strongest, either in muscles, in riches, or in military discipline, have conquered and held in subjection the rest. And she goes on to say, oh, no. I haven't got that, but, it, but certainly then the argument is developed in the subjection of women and they make a quite a long argument about why, you know, we're past all that now. Uh, we're in an age of rationality, we're in an age of the rule of law, and that law is made by humans on a rational basis. I mean, this is going back to Jeremy Bentham and his, um, all of that work at the beginning of the century, um, in textbooks that are still used, you know, that revising the law and, and making it rational and um, uh, um, kind of getting rid of the archaisms of it. Yeah. It was a huge project that I think we take for granted nowadays. Um, so, yeah, so, so what's really interesting is how much this one single idea is really developed in the subjection of women and um, uh, Harriet and Mill, uh, John Stuart Mill talk a lot about um, the comparison of women in the 19th century to the position of enslaved people in the past. And of course they're writing in the context of America still, the United States still having enslavement of um, Africans as you know an economic model um and um they have some very interesting arguments i think about the differences between the enslavement of men and women and the subjection of women within marriage um but there has been some recent sort of decolonizing style uh critiques of the assumptions they make about um the differences between enslaved people and, and women in that, you know, there is a tendency for them to see um, the enslavement, you know, to see women as analogous to being enslaved. Is that more terrible for white women than for black men? And the suggestion, the suspicion is that Harriet and John tend to think it's really awful for white women in Britain, in the 1850s and 60s. Um, so I think there's a certain amount of kind of quite um, of its time sort of centering of, of white European experience and thinking there. And yet uh, the, the, the British uh, Commonwealth, the empire, whatever it was, um, they, they'd done away with uh, slavery on English soil in the in the eighteenth century, haven't they? With yeah, Lord Mansfield. Yeah. Yes, and by eighteen thirty three, um, that abolition act was was you know, um, and um, so there is this, and there's a huge movement throughout the nineteenth century of British radicals involved in abolitionist movements. I mean, Frederick Douglass felt more at home in Britain than he did in America. Um, and we tend to think of the Victorians as racist imperialists. Um, and they were, but there's this other, you know, Mill worked in the East India office and he opposed, he couldn't say it, but um, evidence suggests that he opposed after 1857 the, and the Indian uprising when uh, the British government took over the rule of India. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that he did not, you know, he opposed that. Um, so he's an anti-imperialist, one thinks, you know, in, in that sort of governmental sense. Mm. Yeah. I realise I've gone on for almost an hour. Gosh. 
so I don't know if there's any, I mean, really, you know, I, I've got a lot of text. Um, uh, yeah, here, there's, this is another. I'll just maybe if I'll finish with this socialization and conditions. This is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe if there's discussion or people want to ask questions or raise issues for a bit, and then I can, you know, either finish there or um, depending on how long you want to go on, I'm happy. Um, but we talk nowadays, we certainly did when I was an undergraduate and and, and I used to run a, a master's in, in women's studies back in the day um, uh, in Australia when I was working in Australia. And we used to talk about the idea of conditioning or socialization. And that this is the, um, it's the thing that's quite hard to get hold of. I think particularly in liberal thinking because liberalism does tend to treat each person as an individual. But I think that what um, Harriet and then John Stuart Mill together are trying to think through here are the cultural pressures in what we might call socialization or conditioning that I would now start to call gender roles or sex-based stereotypes, as I've, as I've put in my heading there, um, that we might call masculinity and femininity, yeah? And they start to really unpick this. And I think, along with Mary Wollstonecraft, who also is very interested in the way that women are socialized, and she says that's why they're all you know, stupid and, and she's very rude about women, Mary <laughs> Wollstonecraft, but she says it's because women aren't educated to be clever and think, you know, so here we have a woman who has educated herself, but also I think Harriet's um, presence in the Unitarian circles of Finsbury and William Fox, I think there was a certain amount of kind of just self-education and education through that, um, that community. Um, uh, but clearly she was so clever. Um, yeah. That central sentence, we deny the right, you know, that's an absolute fundamental, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We deny the right of any portion of the species to decide for another portion or any individual for another individual what is and what is not their proper sphere. The proper sphere for all human beings is the largest and highest which they are able to attain to. What it, this is cannot be ascertained without complete liberty of choice. Um, it's worth hanging on to, isn't it? But I don't think it's complete freedom. And Mill, certainly in On Liberty, starts to try to work out what are the social goods of certain types of liberty? And um, I haven't read on liberty for quite some time, but my takeaway from that text is that he's very interested in the difference between the freedom to do something and also the freedom from things. So freedom from poverty, freedom from starvation, freedom from oppression and enslavement are all necessary before you have the freedom that Harriet's talking about here the, to become the largest and highest that we can become. Yes. And that's where I think Mill saw himself as much more of a socialist than a laissez-faire capitalist. Um, and again, I think that that's, so pertinent for liberal democrats today isn't it you know where um under new labor for example where where labor might have forgotten certain parts of its socialism i think the liberal democrats were always there saying we need to 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 think about society yes. in these terms and and uh, harriet does make a, a regular feature about uh women who are allowed they're not allowed to to be educated or to to take part in society ex except when they are the monarch <laughs> yes yeah and of course this is all you know queen victoria victoria ascended to the throne in 1837 mm. and um uh this is all happening when the head of state is a woman 
Um, and I do think, I mean, this is my theory about the pantomime dame. This is a whole other area of my research on, on Victorian pantomime. But I really think the pantomime dame is in part some kind of deep psychological working through of, um, you know, there's a woman in charge of us all <laughs> and she's not pretty, you know, by by this period, by the time the pantomime dame emerges as a real character in pantomime in the 1850s, 1860s, Victoria is that fat, squat, many children, you know. Anyway, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> that sounds interesting. We ought to take that somewhere. Um, <laughs> no, I yeah, I've I've talked about that in various places. It, I'm right. I'm finishing a book about it, so you know, it's it's my my um, radical theory about the emergence of the pantomime dame is that it was a parody of Queen Victoria. Um, but yes, and certainly history. You know, the great queens. Um, I think Harriet is also aware of Elizabeth the first, um, who is seen as such a token of Englishness for the Victorians in many ways isn't she yes you know I mean I did see and then I just this is why I don't buy the Guardian anymore I think I did see an article come up on my Google feed you know the algorithm saying historians talking about Elizabeth the first as non-binary and I'm just going oh no <laughs> I mean you know she was a woman who did a man's job yes which Mill and Taylor say you know Maybe women can do these jobs as well. We just haven't tested them. They haven't been given the opportunity. And um, going back to the uh, Ohio Convention, the education. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and certainly uh, there's a significant section of the subjection of women, which talks about women's education. Um, and... Um, I think this is the voice of John Stuart Mill, probably rather than Harriet, where they write that, you know, we haven't tested what it would be like for men and women to be brought up in the same way. So we don't know whether women would be just as good as men at all of these things if they were given the chance. You know, and it's a little bit, it's quite scientific. You know, we need to have experiments where we take. But I think we've seen that in contemporary education, where once you give young women the level playing field, they really start to run with it and they, they yeah. start to um, perform and sometimes outperform young men. And, and going back to Helen Taylor, their daughter, mm. uh, Harriet's daughter, didn't she get onto the school board? Yes, yes. Even before there was any question of franchise. Mm. And this is where a number of women, there's another um, really interesting writer called Augusta Webster, who also becomes active as an elected official on the London School Board. And women um, were starting towards the end of the 19th century, the 1880s and so on. Women were starting to become involved in local government um, things like the London School Board, they were starting to become prominent in boards of charities. So although they didn't have the franchise for the House of, um, the House of Commons, there were other ways that they were becoming publicly politically active. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge those, because I think this is still one of the ways that women, and particularly feminists, think about their political power. It's not always becoming the MP. It might be about other kinds of activist activities. Yes, like Francis, uh, was it Francis O'Grady, the head of the TUC? Yes. Oh, and she's amazing. She's so kind of logical and clear about, about the trade union movement. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other Francis I think of is I think Francis Crook, who for a long time was um, uh, leading the organisation that the name escapes me that's about um, conditions in prisons. The Howard League. Thank you. See, this is why I'm not really involved in, <laughs> in everyday <laughs> activist politics. <laughs> um, and there's a long tradition of female women's activism in that field 
if we think about Hannah, um, uh, uh, is it Hannah Fry? You know, Elizabeth Fry. Elizabeth Fry, yeah. Elizabeth Fry. Yes. Um, uh, and I think, you know, Florence Nightingale might be another one of those who, um, okay, she was the lady with the lamp, but she then started to become a lobbyist. Really, mm. it's the only way to think about it. You know, she wrote papers, she wrote reports. She became um, a kind of, um, yeah, an activist through lobbying and through administrative. Wasn't she a data scientist, really? A sort of yes. the, of the histogram or something yeah. like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I didn't know she invented that, but that. Oh, well, I didn't know whether she invented it, but she made she made great use of it. Didn't mm, she? Mm, mm. Graphs and and uh, to explain yeah. Yeah. syndrome. And I think this is a different argument, however, than the argument that Taylor here and that Taylor and Mill together um, focus on in these essays. Because the other thing, when you see in the final paragraph, she's put proper sphere in scare quotes. <laughs> And this is the idea that women had their sphere and men had their sphere and that men looked after the public world and women looked after the private world. And, you know, um, uh, there are various female conduct books that say, well, women's influence in raising children, you know, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, all of that kind of thing. I think what, what we're talking about now, about the various ways that women took part in in political activism is a very different approach than the more old fashioned approach about, well, women look after the domestic um, and they have their influence in that way by influencing their husbands. I think that's the conservative argument about women staying at home. And, um, and indeed it's the legal situation in Britain in 1851, once a woman got married, she had no individual independent legal identity. She was what's known as femme couverte. She was the covered woman. Um, and her husband or her male guardian had her legal rights, as it were. So this is why all the Victorian and, uh, um, you know, Jane Austen's novels and all of the Victorian novels that follow on from it. Um, the male guardian doing the marriage settlement for the woman. Once the woman's married, all her property is her husband's until we get the Married Women's Property Act in 1870. Um, Dion has got a, a comment. Oh, yeah. Dion, would you like to feel that? Can I stop sharing for a bit? And... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Hi, sorry, I'm, I'm Dion. I'm, I'm a nurse. I also have a keen interest in history and I think we always think of Florence Nightingale as the lady with the lamb, but she was yeah. a statistician. She, she she predated the histogram, SPC charts, the importance of infection and microbiology. But the other day, we, we portray her as this lady with a lamb, and mm. she was a lot more than that. I will get off my soapbox now. No, no, thank <laughs> you. I mean, I knew what I know of her is that once she came back from the Crimea, she she was quite sickly and she took to her sofa, but she wrote and she wrote letters and she wrote reports and she she had all these young men doing her business in parliament for her. Is that right? Yeah, this yes. is fascinating. Thank you. And no, notes on this and it's still relevant today. Yeah. Years later. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, it was about this time, I think, that uh, even before they actually got the vote, wasn't Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who uh, was the first qualified English doctor, she became yeah. mayor, the first woman mayor of uh, of, of a town in, in Suffolk? Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, I knew that she, she'd gone through and, and got medical training. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think she was the first mayor of uh, Alderborough. And her sister, of course, was Millicent Fawcett. Garrett Fawcett, yeah. Garrett Fawcett. Yeah. Um, um. I mean, I think, and together with Josephine Butler, who led the Anti-Contagious Diseases Act's um, uh, activism, there were some redoubtable women. I mean, it's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Um, <laughs> and often from very respectable, I mean, the, the wonderful feminist professor who taught me in a lot of this, a woman called Barbara Kane, um, an Australian historian, 
wrote a wonderful book about the Potter sisters called Destined to be Wives. Um, and one of the Potter sisters was Beatrice, who married Sidney Webb. And so it's quite a high society family. Um, but they end up in all these radical so movements for social change. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And there's another uh, uh, Beatrix Potter who was more scientific than uh, not just yeah. a writer. Uh, and she was I'm prevented sure she... from speaking. She wants, she had a, a paper to give, but they wouldn't let her give the paper because she was a woman. Yeah, yeah. Well, these stories, you know, I mean, I say this to my undergraduates and, and I say, well, you know, my grandmother was only the second cohort to um, graduate with a full degree from Oxford in 1922. Yeah. And for me, that's living memory. I knew my grandmother. And um, today's 20 year olds kind of look at you and I go, yeah, don't forget where we've come from. <laughs> anyway, I see there's someone with their hand up. Yes, could, you, could, could I chip in? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. far away. Oh, it's um, it just a nice anecdote that when, when they were young, the two Garrett sisters, as they then were, and another friend were sitting around talking about what they could do for advancement of women. Um, and they, the one, who, the, the one who wasn't one of the sisters, I can't remember, was she to do the law, but um, uh, Elizabeth was to become the, was to get in, get medicine open to women. And they said, Millicent, you're the youngest, you must get women the vote, because that will take the longest. <laughs> Great yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what we forget with the um, focus on the the kind of um, direct action, the guerrilla action, if you like, of the suffragettes, is we forget that the, the, the battle for the vote goes back, well, again, John Stuart Mill, when he's elected to Parliament, um, his first, I'm not sure if it's his only, but his first proposed bill is for the enfranchisement of women. How did that go? It didn't. <laughs> it didn't. Was I mean, it too I, radical? But but I think what's really interesting is that you know what we remember of of the Mills is their writing and their sort of theorization. You know, John Stuart Mill is often taught. I first came across him in first year philosophy, um, reading utilitarianism and on liberty. Uh, I was first introduced to him as a as a philosopher, and it's only later in my history degree where I really started to think about him as a kind of someone who was writing about his culture. Um, but we forget that he he was also, you know, he was an activist as well. And Harriet Taylor, to the extent that she could, you know, she's bound by childcare and illness and then early death. Um, and I mean, her health was such that I think um, a really public role wasn't always possible. Um, although they did have, you know, the at home. So, they, um, and th this is why she died in Avignon in France. They'd gone to France to see if the, the nicer air could cure her. She was consumptive as well, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, now, both Harriet and Mary Wollstonecraft, I think they were scandalous, weren't they? Obviously, mm. Harriet's marital situation. Yes. Um, or, or, or was it? Is that why they weren't uh, given an opportunity to shine, or were they declared to be outcasts because of their challenging writing? I think it's probably the former. Um, and I remember um, a conversation actually I had with Barbara Kane about this, about the influence of Mary Wollstonecraft's work on. 90, on Victorian feminists, had did Jane Austen read Mary Wollstonecraft, for example? Really interesting question. Because there are, is some evidence in Jane Austen's novels, for example, to suggest that she may well have read Mary Wollstonecraft. But of course, Mary Wollstonecraft lived with William Godwin without marriage. Um, and it was only... Um, on the conception and pregnancy with Mary Shelley, right? So we're talking a real dynasty here of, of philosophers and thinkers in British culture. Um, it, was, it was Godwin wanting his adored Mary Wollstonecraft, he adored her to have the 
security of marriage and its social status. Right. Um, and she did not want to be married. But one of the theories is that because of that scandalous reputation, it was scandal by association for women later on in the 19th century to admit that they'd read that. And the further evidence, I mean, this is sort of speculative, but the further evidence I would offer to that is the evidence of another writer, uh, George Eliot, who was Mary Ann Evans, who lived with George Henry Lewis, who was already married and would not divorce his wife. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons for that. She uh, was mentally unstable and it was very complicated. But they lived together and in one of her letters, she writes um, a, a, an admiring, she had a lot of female admirers. There was a kind of a quite a, um, it's often described as quite sapphic circle around George Eliot. Um, and it was kind of a hero worship from this extraordinary woman writer. She was a brain, you know, um, and a young woman writes and George Eliot writes back and she writes in this letter, I would invite you to visit me, but I realize this might not be possible. For, or she said, I'm not going to invite you because I don't want to put you under that obligation when it might be difficult for you. And that I think is implicit. It's her tacit um, acknowledgement that a young unmarried woman visiting a woman living with a man you know, without marriage, even though she was called Mrs. Lewis and so on, um, would have... Um, reputational risk. Rep yeah, yeah, reputational risk for the young woman, yeah. Mm. And I can't help but feel, when I read the letter, I sort of thought, am I reading into it, or is there this sort of tinge of regret? Well, I think it's quite a heroic thing for George Eliot to say. She said, you know, I would love to meet you, but I understand... You know, I'm not going to invite you to put you under that pressure, but I'm at home on such and such an afternoon every week. Yes, yes. You know, so, um, and I think it's, um, there's evidence to suggest it seems like young women of respectable classes would not have walked the main London streets on their own. They would have been with another woman, with a maid, with their brother, their father, their, you know, um, they tended to wear um, hats with veils, so their faces, things that were so normal that they often go unnoted in the documentation. And you just pick up little threads of, oh, wearing a bonnet with a veil was the way women went out into town. And of course, it's it's inflected by class. And it's probably inflected by where they lived and so on. Um, but, um, you know, Harriet Taylor, when when her friendship with John Stuart Mill became too scandalous, Harriet Taylor had a had a, a sort of an agreed separation. She lived separately from her husband. Um, but to be very prurient about it, I doubt that she and John Stuart Mill actually had um, uh, an affair in a physical sense. I very much doubt that. And, and that's probably not from her, but from him. <laughs> I, I think too much about John Stuart Mill, obviously. <laughs> and his upbringing was uh, yeah. unique, I think. Yes. Different. I don't know if anyone on this call has read his autobiography. It's a cracking read, but you do get a sense of it being, yeah, unique is a good word. I mean, he himself um, acknowledges that um, he had a very distinctive um, upbringing. His upbringing brings gives me uh, the idea of, you know, these uh, youngsters nowadays who are force fed into A-levels at 10 or 12 or 13 and, and, and then go off to Oxbridge with their parent in tow which seems to me to be a very you know iffy sort of upbringing yeah. doesn't it? they don't get that rounding that you get if you no. have a life with absolutely I mean um 
John Stewart was a kind of experiment by his father and um, uh, James Mill and his father's best friend, Jeremy Bentham. <laughs> Um, and the idea was that the child's mind is a blank slate. It's very John Locke, um, the 17th century philosopher who thought we were tabula rasa. Um, and he was hot housed in learning Latin and Greek. And, you know, he says, I don't remember when I learned Greek. I mean, I, I will say I don't remember when I learned to read, but I was yeah. reading English. You know, yeah. he doesn't remember when he learned to read three other languages, two of them dead. So um, he, uh, yeah, he was hot house. And he goes through in his late 20s what he calls a crisis in his mental development. And it's at about this time that he meets Harriet um, as well. So uh, he starts reading poetry. He meets Harriet. Um, he starts to see that there is more to the world than this very logical, rational philosophy. And so the rest of his career, and I think this is really important for understandings of liberalism, the rest of his career, he's trying to say, well, yes, liberty, but for what? Right. How will we use this? And yes, utilitarianism, the greatest, you know, the principle of government should be the greatest good for the greatest number of people. But what is good? What is that good that we want people to have a lot of? Is it act utilitarian or rule utilitarian? You know, it's the end, isn't it? Rather than the, yeah. the means. Yeah. yeah. And whereas Bentham said, whatever gives anyone pleasure, pushpin is as good as poetry. Mill wanted to say, no, there are some things that are more important and significant and, and he found that in poetry. Now that will bring us back to your interest in 19th century drama because <laughs> you know we're, we're missing this because it's not deemed as as valuable as the classic canon. Uh, no, is that right? No. Yeah yeah. And yeah. so you're you're talking about more pushpin things rather than I you am know, <laughs> tell us a bit more about that then. Oh really do people want to know well my argument really is that um, the kind of culture, the popular culture that we live in today is formed out of the, the dual forces of this kind of radicalism we've been talking about all evening, coming out of the French Revolution, coming out of uh, there's no more God. I mean, one of the things John Stuart Mill says in um, his autobiography is he says, well, plenty of people become atheists he says, I think I was the first person in Britain raised completely without religion, religious belief. Mm -hmm. And I think it's significant that Harriet was a Unitarian. Because what we know about Unitarians is that they did not believe in the tripartite God. The, you know, they thought Jesus was not the son of, you know, was not part of the, the, the son of the mm -hmm. Father, the Holy Ghost. Not part yeah. of that right. The Trinity. Um, they it was split. I always hear the life of Brian in my head. They just thought <laughs> Jesus was a very good man. Yeah. You know, not a, he's not the Messiah, he's just a naughty boy. He's <laughs> not the Messiah, he's just a very good man. Right. And that the Unitarians were often very involved in um socially progressive causes because they said the example of Jesus is the example of how someone can live the good life for others in the world. And so I think it's interesting that Harriet, that was Harriet's um, religious spiritual circle. So, you know, nowadays people joke about Quakers being where well, you don't have to believe in God to be a Quaker. Um, in a sense, the Unitarians were um, non-conformist in that same way. And of course, Mrs. Um, Gaskell was a Unitarian. Their, their Sorry. Sorry? Mrs. Gaskell's husband yes. was a Unitarian. Yeah, she's famously a Unitarian. Yeah, yeah. And again, she's very involved in trying to work out how the working classes of Manchester lived and how they felt and how they thought yes. um, and how they survived. So the, the, what you're saying then is the foment about and the ferment in society yeah. led to a theatre tradition 
which was well, not... it led to a change from a kind of elite theatre of the 18th century right. um, into this uh, into a much more mass popular culture. So London exponentially expands, and whereas in the 18th century you had two main theatres and one one other theatre. You had the Theatres Royal Drury Lane and Theatre Royal Covent Garden and then the Theatre Royal Haymarket. And they were known as the legitimate theatres. They had the Theatres Royal patent. So they could produce all the, you know, Shakespeare and Sheridan and all the great classics of the English dramatic canon. Um, by the time you've got loads of people coming into London, the whole of the South Bank and the East End expanding, People, we don't have the tube. Transport is your feet or a horse. A working man working in a factory doesn't have a horse. So people want entertainment close by them. And they don't necessarily want aristocratic comedies of the restoration. They want stuff about their lives. And so you have melodrama. Mm -hmm. And one of the writers of melodrama during the French Revolution in France, they called it the Theatre of the Boulevard in France, and this guy, uh, Eugène Pixericourt, is n apparently, I think it's apocryphal because, he, you know, but he is supposed to have said he writes plays for the, the sans culottes on wow. the street who can't read. Right. Um, and so if you think of, I, I teach a course on melodrama and the first week I get my students to, we watch an episode of EastEnders together. And when I talk to them about what television they watch, their soap opera style of television now is Love Island or um, uh, Survivor or any of these kind of reality, you know, and they see the same kind of melodramatic reflection of contemporary life, but times 20, which is what you might get with melodrama. Um, but the form of melodrama where you have this very... Um, it's ordinary people. It's not kings and queens anymore. And it's certainly not the gods of Greek tragedy. I see. So no, it's, but it's, it's, it's the, the bottle it's pleasure problems people. rather than the comedie francaise. Or... Yeah, yeah. And it's ordinary people and ordinary working life, which in the 18th century, and still there's a debate about it in the 19th century, in the same way that we have a debate now about Love Island, you know, rotting our brains or whatever i i don't watch love islander but i do have a friend who loves all of these things and she got me into watching the masked singers or something over lockdown or, you know and it's fun it's really interesting and and it's all to a formula and it's all about a kind of pleasure button that it presses um but what melodrama and low comedy and pantomime all do is they take ordinary people and put their lives on the stage. And this is quite revolutionary at the beginning of the 19th century because the lives of ordinary people are not thought to be significant enough or important enough to warrant being called art. Right. And there are huge debates about that in the 19th yeah. century. I see. So so yeah. uh, what, what we'll be seeing in the uh, Women Theatre Net Mm. And scary little girls will be more of this sort of theatre, which is yeah, demotic and, rather than. And my argument, yes, and my argument is that we're starting to understand this change in popular entertainment and how it leads to where we are today. But the big gap always is what were the women doing in that? It's still a very male-centered set of studies, and I'm really interested in um, what I'm interested. I wrote a big book of, oh god 15 years ago now on British women playwrights of the 19th century and there were at least 500 and they wrote over a thousand plays and no one knows anything about them um what I'm now working on is how those women traveled um and for example one of the first European style commercial theatres in Bombay in the 1820s was managed by a woman Right. Now, who knew that? So, OK, we were invading and colonising India, Australia, and they're the two countries. And then with a with a bit of a, a between Dublin and London, I'm really interested in how many how many writers and women writers we see as 
British or English and they're actually originally Irish. And there's Sheridan a really, as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that, yeah, Sheridan. Yeah. George Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde. You know, but we claim them for English literature, don't we? Because of that colonial relationship between the island of England, of Great Britain, and the island of Ireland. Yes. Um, but I'm really interested in the way that women took theatre out over the empire, um, either as performers or writers or managers or wives. So it's a big piece of work. I've got other people coming in to, to do some of Wow. That. And you'll be having uh, projects with people from other countries in Europe? And yes. Yeah, Worldwide. yeah, there's a network of people um, that I've worked with over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so. Um, and we'll be bringing them together. And there's quite a, it's a European, it's an EU grant, a European Research Council, but funded by the EU. So we're still allowed to be part of that, thank goodness. Fabulous. Um, and um, one of the aims of it is to train young scholars. So there'll be postdoctoral fellows, there'll be a PhD student, there'll be bursaries for other PhD students to come to our conferences. So hopefully there'll be a way of, of you know, making it larger. It's not just me where well, it is at the moment, but it will get bigger. <laughs> I, I hope that will be uh, really published widely for ordinary women as well, not just, uh, not, not uh, obviously academic purposes, but mm, mm. for also for women to, to be able to take note of the fact that this is not new. No, and one of the things that I'm thinking about, I'm just starting to do the recruitment for my postdoctoral fellows, and one of them I want to work on the Indian material, which is mostly in the British Library, ironically, because of the East India Company and so on, is to maybe think about whether um, there's a what we call a trade book. You know, there's a more popular book in that about um, women making theatrical empires, something like that, I think. Yeah. You know, but certainly um, I'm always up for talking about it in this kind of context as well. Um, and um, I always try and teach uh, my undergraduates. I still teach undergraduates, even though I do all this other stuff. Um, I always try and make sure that my I'm teaching my undergraduates what I'm researching. So they have an input and then they can take it out into the world as well. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. And let's see, I don't know whether we've got any questions. Um, have we got anybody with hands up with questions you want to ask? Because uh, I think this is new for a lot of us. And uh, yeah, Sorry, I've raced through a lot of material. <laughs> I, I know people will be interested to see your slides. So if you if you don't mind sending them to me. Yes, if I send them to you, then Fabulous. You yeah. mostly it's just cut and pasted the, what I thought were the interesting bits from a series, you know, a whole lot of um uh um taylor and mills writings okay um, and there are there is um as i said that you know there are a couple of very thick volumes i think you've got one alice and this is the complete works of harriet taylor mill <laughs> it's this thick yeah <laughs> and that includes quite a lot of her letters yeah it's um, uh, it's a brick isn't it <laughs> but these are kind of you know mostly in academic libraries i think sadly because they're very expensive books um, Rachel, did you have a question? Um, it's not so much a question, it's just it's some feedback to, that um, I, I, I felt you very powerfully evoked for me um, the atmosphere, the environment in which um, uh, Harriet was working um, and how... Um, uh, how essential to life these things were, you know, mm -hmm. wh whether it's legitimate for somebody to beat you and murder you or whether the, the, the law will protect you, whether you can have property, whether, whether you can raise your own child, mm -hmm. um, uh, how we dealt with um, men's sexual behaviour and the infectious diseases that they brought to women's doors and how um, women um, were doubly punished for that. Um, you know, the, these are these are real, real sort of life and death matters. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, and I guess it was a very strong argument as well that obviously it, it would have been difficult for people to say, to justify them by referring to the inadequacy of women when you have a, a female monarch. A women's mm. brains can't do this. A women can't understand these things. Um, yeah, and yet we've got a queen. So how do you, how are you going to uh, reconcile those two things? Yeah. So, but yeah, uh, yeah no, I I did enjoy that background, and um, I I I thought it was kind to be a bit sort of drawing roomish, and <laughs> so that's my ignorance. <laughs> no no well thank you for that and and thank you for saying that I think you've summarized really powerfully um what's at stake here and we do tend to think of the Victorians as as you say drawing roomish don't we I mean obviously this is a little bit before but it's we think of the 19th century as this time of respectability and you know hiding things away and so on um and I like to remind people that there was this there was also this very radical thread of activism it was a, it was an activist century um as we are today you know i'm sure in a hundred years time people will look back and talk about the activism of this period as well you know i think change is 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 the constant here almost but um I think also what you say about um, how important these issues are, I'm often struck by a rhetoric in the, and I think it's now being called the new trad, but I've, I've actually had young women in classes say to me, oh, well, I don't really want to work or, you know, I want to just get married and have children and look after my family. I know, 20 year olds, and my in my head, I'm going, what are you doing at university? <laughs> you know, someone else could have had your place. <laughs> but I don't say that. <laughs> I say, well, <laughs> you know, you still need to be educated to raise your children. And what if your husband suddenly can't earn money if he becomes ill? I didn't say, what if he runs off with the secretary after you've had three children and you're, you know, you're, you're not as beautiful as you were. Because uh, one of the young women that said this to me once was astoundingly beautiful. You know, she had what to, what do they call it? Um, sexual capital almost and so I don't say all these things I do say well you know um but it also made me think and I do talk to my students now about this that okay work is dreary and we're all wage slaves and so on but so much of the particularly the fictional literature in the 19th century written by women the Bronte sisters for example um is about the need for meaningful socially meaningful work that is recognized and I, I think what you see this in a lot of 19th century literature by women is um, they want to take part in the public world of their culture they want the highest sphere the sorry they want the highest sphere they can attain to Yes, yes. And, um, you know, they yearn to be artists or um, doctors or whatever. And and I think we need to remember that it's only 150 years ago that women had to really fight to do these things. And these are possibly fragile rights. I mean, I and they're still, they're still live issues, though, aren't they? What Rachel was just saying about, and, and and Mill was saying about, you've told us about tonight, about domestic violence and murder, <clears throat> murdering women. These are still annual, live, daily issues now. You know, the, the, the feminist femicide census and those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, what, um, uh, um, the woman who keeps that list. Karen Ingallis-Smith. Karen Ingallis-Smith, yeah. And and runs that woman only. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, there's a, someone. Got their hand oh, up. who who else has got a hand up? Um, Dion. That was me. Dion, fire away, yeah. Dion. 
I, I guess the point for me and, and a question to think about, um, I'm struck by how apathetic women are around voting when <laughs> women sacrifice their lives really for the right to vote. And mm -hmm. I stand here as a, a woman from a, you know, from a ethnic minority background. And uh, it strikes me when I'm canvassing how apathetic women are, young women, some young women are about the rights to vote. And I wonder, yeah, mm -hmm. if, if the ancestors fought, the, fought for this in vain. I know, I know, I know. I mean, I think there are some, yeah, I, each year I teach a, um, a university module in, in the drama department. It's sort of English and history students come along to it as well, called Women and Theatre. And I put the date 1700 to 1928. And my first, you know, when we we're doing the first introductory seminar, and I say to them, do any of you know why I used the date 1928? And each year, actually, at least one or two young women will know, because I, I sometimes get young men in that class, but it's mostly just women, which is quite nice, really. I know that I had a young man there this year, and he was, he was super, you know, he was great. Um, uh, and but there will be a couple that will say, "Oh yeah, that's the year that all adult women got the vote." So some of them do know. And, and why um, seventeen hundred? The earlier. Uh, oh, seventeen hundred is just—it's a useful date. Um, I can fit in Susanna St. Livre, and a colleague of mine teaches a module in Restoration Theatre, <laughs> which is sort of sixteen sixty-two to, you know. So it's there's no particular reason for the beginning date, but the end date there's a reason um and actually in the final seminar I was teaching it last term so we finished just before Christmas and I thought this year I'm going to do something a little bit different we always have a feedback session where I sort of say okay what didn't work for you in the module this year you know what didn't you like what wouldn't you know what did you like what should I do more of and and we generally have quite a good face-to-face -face conversation and um and no one's pointed their finger at me and gone, you wicked transphobe. So, you know, we're all good. <laughs> um, but um, this year, I also asked them to do a little bit of writing just for themselves. They didn't have to tell anyone what was in it about how they would use some of the things they'd learned in the module forward in the rest of their lives. And some of them did come up, just thinking about it makes me a little bit weepy because some of them did come up with, you know, one of them said, I've learned how much women are made invisible and silenced. And I'm going to make sure I center women's work in anything I do in the future. And she wants to go on and be a journalist. You know, so, so there's hope. Yeah. yeah. My work here is done, you said. <laughs> well, yeah, it's never done. It's always you know, it's a process, isn't it? And I don't know how you find with, with nursing, with training young nurses, what their understanding of the, their, their history and their profession is, but one hopes they have some understanding. No? <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to navigate to, to do a bit more of history as part of nursing education. I think people get so focused on the other bit and history mm. is important. It's mm. important to where we are now. You know, as I said to our to nurses, you know, the radical group in 1970, nurses were radical to get the right for registration. So, mm. you know, nurses now think that they are radical. It started long before, and I think that context is important, but yeah. I'll get off my soapbox. Yes, and I do think this is partly why we are where we are now, is that um, for some reason in the 1980s and 1990s, oh, I was running an MA in women's studies in the 1990s, but we sort of thought, oh, right, the big battles are won. <clears throat> and I think we stopped saying to young women, certainly in higher education, we stopped saying, you need to know this stuff. Because we thought it's embedded now. You know, they will go on knowing it. Um, and I think that young women, and I think you could also say this for uh, young radicals more generally, um, aren't being given their uh, their history of their own political affiliations. Yeah. Um, and where it is done, it's done in a, a very broad brush way. You know, the whole move to decolonize um, school and university curricula is done in a way that 
starts to become this sort of, well, the British Empire was just bad. And that doesn't help either. You know, I think there's more nuance that's needed in all, all of these, um, these well-meaning, but, but I do think that something happened and, and there's a generation of women that weren't given their history. Um, so I try and do it a group of 20 students a time, <laughs> once a year, 20 students. Um, you do what you can. It's a tiny little pebble into a huge pond. <laughs> yeah, but crucial. And I think we took our, our eyes off the ball a bit, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. In recent years. Yeah. Anybody else got any questions? Uh, some people with the with the pictures on, but not live. Uh, any more questions? Because I I just like to ask one more thing, and that is. Um, there's a hand gone up as well. Oh, so we... where, 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 where? Tom, Can you... Tom please uh, give us your... Uh, yeah, well, one thing that's always struck me is the way that in the First World War, and I guess in the Second too, um, mm. factory work liberated women from domestic mm. service. Yes. They saw what we might think as drudgery. It was a liberation for them. It gave them more money in their pocket, more free time, more, more control. Um, yeah. Let let you know bosses breathing down their necks in the same way. Yeah, 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 yes. And I think this is um, this is a, an ongoing debate in all sorts of feminist theory and activism, which is is work liberatory, or is it just women becoming like men? And I'm not sure it's either or. I mean, I think you know, there's all this this it's it's grey in the middle, but certainly. Um, the freedom, because of course, being a domestic servant, you had, you know, we know all of this. You had, you had to go to church on Sunday. You had maybe one day off a month. Your private life was not your own. You know, your private life was. You weren't allowed followers, boyfriends. Um, you had to maintain respectability. And I mean, I speak from coming from a very, it's like several hundred years of upper middle class wealth in my family, right? And um, my apparently my great, great uncle is the father of Stanley who found Livingston, a Roland in, in Wales, right? And um, the family story, and I'm brought up with this story about, oh yeah, yeah, the Stanley who found Livingston is really your great, great uncle or whatever, but it was a huge family scandal. He basically raped, a um a servant and she was cast out of the family home and you know it was that kind of it's it's this violence again and again and again mm -hmm. um and all the biographies of stanley i've ever i was talking to a livingston scholar once at a conference and i said well you know there's this family story and i said roland yeah that's my grandmother's family <laughs> and he um cut all acknowledgement of any of that, you know, I mean, he, if, if I'd ever met him, he would have, I don't know, he would pr probably tried to, you know, he wouldn't have speak, spoken to me. So, so um, these things are part of people's family lives, I think. Um, and, and yet factory work was not safe for women. They were not safe from sexual assault in factories. Yes. Yes. Um, and there are a number of women um, who write about this in, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, Elizabeth Robbins, who's a very interesting, she's an actress who's also a playwright and novelist and a suffragette. And um, she writes about the, uh, the situation of working, young working women who, you know, if they get sacked or whatever. Uh, George Bernard Shaw wrote about this in Mrs. Warren's Profession where he really forces you to the edge of, um, well, is it better to work in a brothel or in a munitions factory? You know, so the debate around work is a really um, difficult one, but absolutely factory work that we might see as drudgery. And this is what I go back to in, you know, my students who say, oh, they don't really want to work. They just want to have a family. And I'm thinking they don't know 
drudgery from work, you know, yeah. yeah. So, um, and of course, women did that factory work um, just as well as the men did, you know, they adapted, they, they, um, uh, uh, and, and um, one of the theories, isn't it, uh, in the United States about the whole move in the 1950s back to families and the white picket fence and so on, was that they needed to get the women out of those male labouring jobs so that the men could come back in. That's the work. Reserve Army of Labour theory, yes. isn't it? Yeah, I learned about that in political yeah. economy. Yeah, the Reserve Army of Labour. Yeah. I was just about to and it probably is that. still... Sorry. Sorry. I was just about to come in on that point that women are like a, a buffer that when you need, you can draw them in. And then when you don't need them anymore, um, you uh, either legislate or you make the environment hostile um, and they will vote with their feet. Um, or nudge. That, might be, that may be what's happening to those young women. Yes. That yes. they are finding that it was sold to them as a, attractive but they they're going and they're getting frustrated and barriers and that they still have to manage a home and they if they have children then they're not able to look after their own children and you know mm -hmm. so it, it 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 does feel like um the men have decided that we've had too had too much room for too long and they're going to get their pointy elbows out, and um, but I think it's I think it's Beatrix Campbell who points out there's a class element to this as well, that um, you know patriarchy is terrible for women, but it's not particularly good for working class men. Yeah. Um, you know, so um, and capitalism. Uh, I, I mean, I think part of our current trouble that we find ourselves in over you know what is a woman and all of these kinds of things is that a lot of the the what is now called the second wave the sort of 1970s women's lib and so on part of what we had to do and I can remember I was kind of like 17 or 18 in the late 70s I can remember going I can remember I was living in Australia at the time and there was a lot of administrative bureaucratic you know uh, equal pay all of those administrative um legal kinds of structures but in order to get that pro i think we had to pretend as women or you know and it wasn't just women doing that there were men who were bob hawking australia was very involved in getting women equal pay in the trade union movement but in order to do it you kind of had to pretend that women's bodies were exactly the same as men's bodies and that women didn't have children <laughs> You know, um, you couldn't admit to sexual difference because in the past, sex sex difference had been the reason to keep women out of public life. Yeah. And I think that what we're coming up against now is the consequence of that. So you can kind of try and put women into 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 workplaces which are organized around the male life cycle where you don't have to take a year out to have a child and get over, you know, get the, get rid of the baby brain and or just get some sleep. Yeah, you know, it, it does take about a year for your body to, um, and we, and women sort of have to pretend that that's not happening to them, you know. So um, it's interesting how the whole push at the moment on acknowledging menopause in the workplace is actually starting to say, yeah, women do go through something here. Although my workplace manages to have a menopause policy without mentioning the word woman once. <laughs> Gosh, uh, amazing. One step forward, two steps back. <laughs> no, anyway, I'm just riffing now, sorry. But, has anybody but I think, I, Sorry, go on. No, I was just gonna say, I think um, Tom and Rachel's points about, about um, uh, work being a liberation but it also having drawbacks most drawbacks for men as well you know the, I mean the incidence of men dying at work and mortality rates for men are really pretty horrible women are lucky they don't have to deal with that maybe I, you know. yeah yes well look I, I think that uh, we've... 
Sorry, Tom, you were going to say? So, some of them were poisoned by the chemicals in munitions were that we were all working yeah. on. Yes. And yeah, the but, I mean, I know some men's liberationists will talk about, well, you don't send women down the coal mines, do you? You send men to do that kind of work. And I think it's a good point. You know, it's a fair point. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, uh, if, if anybody's got any more comments, then, then now's your time to, uh, to come up with them. Otherwise, I think we're... We've we've taken so much of your time this evening, Kate. Thanks very Pleasure. much. Uh, but we've had a really good look at, you know, Harriet Taylor Mill. One last question: If we want to see more, uh, find out more about Harriet Taylor Mill, where where do you recommend that we go to look for more information? Right. Well, um, uh, there are some references that are on the slides. Whether right. those books are widely available is tricky um but i think local libraries might be able to get them on into library loan okay. um and i also think that there are various internet free archive sites um google books google books often has um pdfs uh that have just been photographed of of these older texts right and there's an organization called the Haffi Trust, H-A-T-H-I. And they've got a lot of digitized material that is mostly free, either to download or to read online. And then there's the um, archive.org. And it's just archive.org. And again, that has a lot of digitized material that's free to download or read online. There, yes. there are some extraordinary free sites for anything out of copyright. Gutenberg. The Project Gutenberg, Gutenberg Project. yeah. That yeah. doesn't have very much. These other ones have more. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I think we have plenty of reading to be doing. And, uh, you know, she's a very much a very distinctive voice. Yeah. Um, has anybody got any more comments? Uh, Imogen, you've turned on your camera. No, you just, okay. Well, look, I'm going to say thank you uh, very much indeed, Kate. Uh, for your uh, your exposition, um, your talk about Harriet Taylor Mill, and a way of looking again at uh, at the 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 er story, uh, the her story, <laughs> her story as well um, of of uh, activism and political engagement and enfranchisement. It's been really interesting. I, I'm also interested in your theatre thing, so I'm going to try and keep keep uh, in touch with that as it goes along. Tweet it so we know what's coming up. Um, okay, and uh, I'm I'm hoping that we'll be able to get some women going to see some of the uh, the the presentations. So. Thank